All right, so Norm, as always, it's great to have you back on the show. And I think we just need to jump right into it. And we, we need to discuss the charges against Trump that were presented in Tuesday's Manhattan arraignment. Now, I want to start by saying that today I'm not going to be giving any of my fabulous commentary. Rather, I'm going to be asking <laughs> Norm. I'm going to ask you, Norm, right? <laughs> Mr. No, Mr. Ethics Czar here. I'm going to ask you a series of questions about Thank the you. arraignment. All right. And we'll get into we'll get into some of the things that the judge said, that Trump said, prosecutors said, and so on. So let me start by asking you the very first question. What yes. stands out to you most about yesterday's Manhattan DA's arraignment? Um, the, um, thing that stands out to me most, Michael, is that, um, yesterday's arraignment was really about accountability for election interference. As I wrote in the New York Times, uh, uh, the, um, the and on CNN opinion, there was so much to say that I had to write two opinion pieces, uh, Michael. Um, the 2016 election interference that um, that occurred, which could have swung the election um, uh, because it was such a close election, a little over 70,000 votes in three states and another sex scandal coming right after Access Hollywood could have been the end of the Trump campaign. That's a democracy crime. Yes, it's a false books and records, alleged crime. Yes, it's a campaign finance crime that you served time for. You stood up, you admitted it, you made amends. Um, and uh, But above all, uh, it's, it's, it's an allegation about our democracy. And it was the gateway drug for the 2019 um, election interference where Trump asked the president of Ukraine to attack his then leading opponent who ultimately beat him, Joe Biden. That's election interference. And and of course, the 2020 attempt to overturn the legitimate election results. So that's what stood out to me the most. Of course, I couldn't help but thinking about you. Um, and, and, and friends, I'm so honored that Michael invited me on the podcast because now that the case has been arraigned, of course, he's an important witness. Um, he's not able to say every single thing he might want to say. And as a friend of this podcast, as a friend of Michael's, uh, he and I actually became friends through investigating the Hush Money case together because one of the first things I did when I was appointed impeachment counsel was to come to New York, visit with Michael, talk to him, the hush, because the hush money case was an impeachable offense. It was an assault against our democracy. That's just what impeachment is about. Corruption that affects elections. That's what the founders and framers wanted. So we became friends as a result. Michael, you've never wavered in your story as I was thinking about you watching the arraignment writing my two pieces. It's hard to write two simultaneous opinion pieces. It's hard for the enough number, to write one. <laughs> it was for the, and Michael, I'm so proud, for the number one and the number two news most viewed U.S. news website. So we covered the false claims about the case. And I'm not going to ask you to comment on this. You're a witness. I wrote with one of your great predecessors. I think, uh, Michael Cohen is the uh, John Dean of our generation. So I wrote with one of your great predecessors. Just listen, everybody. Michael, I wish you could see him on screen as he's biting his lip, letting me talk. <laughs> You're look, doing look, great, look, Michael. Look, first of all, yeah, I appreciate great. that. First of all, I, I, I still to this, I don't consider myself to be a hero. You know, it's my case obviously is somewhat different than John Dean's. It's similar, but... Um, Hero. No, I don't no, accept. I didn't say no. you. I, I didn't say you were. You know, I didn't say you were identical to John Dean. But I do think yeah. you have that role in our 
in our generation. And I know for me in the impeachment, you had that role. So you asked me, what were my thoughts? I thought about democracy. I thought about that history. I thought about how I investigated these hush money uh, offenses as high crimes and misdemeanors. And I thought about my friend Michael. And there's one other thing I thought, uh, which is uh, it, it, once I got the papers in the case, there is a, if you'll pardon my expression, shit ton of corroboration for every single point in this case. So, um, you know, as important as Michael Cohen is uh, into the story, every single point is heavily, heavily corroborated. And these 40 detailed 44 paragraphs of the statements of facts that Alvin Brad filed, tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You know, I was watching CNN this morning with uh, Don, uh, Poppy and Caitlin and yes. your co-author, Karen uh, Friedman uh, Agnifilo, who's new t- as a legal analyst there uh, on CNN, she, sc- she pushed back and in a brilliant way. And I suspect that this is based upon the writing that the two of you did together in that New York Times piece. But she pushed back against this tidal wave this tidal wave of critics that want to sit there and say that Alvin Bragg's case against Donald Trump is a weak case. Why did he bring it? I've had friends who are with the D who used to work at the DA's office. I have friends from, well, I can't even call him a friend anymore. He's an idiot and a half who's just a massive Trump supporter cursing at me, you know, on, you know, on a text message that this is a bullshit case. This is the weakest of all the cases. Why did Alvin Bragg go forward with this? And so when she pushed back and she turned around and she said, I don't think that you understand what's inside this document. And I don't think that you understand that we're not supposed to be categorizing which case which (laughs) crime is more relevant than the other let the da let fonnie willis bring her case when she's ready let special counsel smith bring his case or cases when he's ready and so on as just did alvin bragg he brought his case when he felt comfortable and so on in in fact the name of the article that the two of you penned is called we finally know the case against trump and it is strong do me a favor put your take onto it well um you know one of the things i love about coming on with you and and friends who are listening uh you know, Michael, as you know, he has a mind of his own. So he makes me think when I come on. Um, uh, I think of things I never thought before, and then I sit and think some more. Um, my uh, take uh, is that um, the misdemeanor, the core misdemeanor offense, which is a lesser included offense here of, of falsifying books and records, is a slam dunk. You can't, you know, say that hush money payments are legal fees. Um, I think that the, I've written tens of thousands of words about this. I think that the critics who don't understand the how New York books and records cases proceed are way underestimating the case. Is it a 100% guaranteed victory? No, no case is. No. Nope. Uh, but boy, it's a strong case. It's not novel. Trump is the thirtieth defendant to face a books and records case uh, since just since Bragg took office a little over a year ago from the Manhattan DA. There have been um, uh, hundreds and hundreds of these cases. I cataloged some of the most similar ones, more than fifty. <laughs> That's just the most similar ones in New York. That includes multiple cases that fit the exact pattern here. Falsifying records to cover up campaign finance and possible tax issues. Um, you have you have that pattern of falsification to hide campaign finance illegalities. 
I do not want you to comment on this. One of the big conversations with truly my beloved friend, Michael, that I'm constantly having with him as, you know, the saying unavailable for comment, Michael, you're unavoidable for comment. So I'm constantly telling him, don't comment. Do not comment on what I'm about to say, Michael. Um, but um, uh, it's a very common um, uh, 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 uh matter to prosecute these campaign finance violations. And that's why Michael went to jail. So the injustice of that, how can we say no one is above the law if Michael goes to jail and not Trump? So I I just think that I just you're going to comment. I can't stop you. But I just think that the critics, it's well intentioned. It's not like what Trump and his lawyers are saying. That's disinformation. Like that intent to defraud is not proven. It's ridiculous if you have an agreement to hide campaign finance, possible tax issues. Ridiculous. But but um, the good faith critics, I think, need to crack the books. And that's why I keep writing all this stuff. And that's why I have two op-eds up. New York Times CNN opinion. So I'm going to read to you from Karen Friedman Agnifilo. Her statement today when they brought this up on that CNN piece. And she yeah, said, I think she's terrific, strong. isn't she? She Fantastic. I think it's wrong. And of course, you know, her pedigree uh, coming from that office is just, you know, you can't get better than that. So she says, I think it's strong because in addition to the indictment that was filed, they also filed a statement of facts, which, and then Poppy jumps in and says, 13 pages. And Karen responds, yeah, 13 pages of a statement of facts really details the evidence and the charges and the theory of the case against him. And it is clear that they have a lot of corroboration here. You've got not just the word of Michael Cohen. You've got Michael Cohen. You've got David Pecker, who was the CEO of AMI that owned the National Enquirer. And they had a conspiracy. Same thing that you're referring to. The three of them to catch and kill negative stories during the time of the presidential campaign. And it's that they have the proof. They have emails, text messages, recordings. And so, and the timing really shows that that's the case. And she goes on and on. Now, another thing that constantly is now getting brought up is the fact that the SDNY ended up, once Trump was no longer president, they decided not to move forward with the case. In fact, they had Cy Vance on yesterday evening who turned around and he said he was contacted by the by the Southern District of New York when all of this mischievous in my life was going on, when all this crazy shit was happening. Cy Vance was contacted by the SDNY, by those dirty motherfuckers who turned around and they decided to tell him to stand down. Stand down. Don't do anything. Now, Let's just couple that fact with Jeffrey Berman, who was the former head of the Southern District, who was contacted by Maine Justice and told what to do, despite he was allegedly recused himself. Instead, what did he end up doing? He decided to give immunity both to David Pecker, gave immunity to Alan Weisselberg, uh, didn't prosecute on Trump, writes in his book, that he didn't want to get fired. You know, I filed a grievance, a bar grievance against him. I got back the decision yesterday, turned around saying that even though I had asked for a reevaluation of their initial decision not to hold him accountable for unethical or illegal behavior, I got a letter yesterday saying that they're standing by their first decision. There's no accountability for these people. Except yesterday, as you stated accurately, Donald Trump is now being held accountable. And we, as the citizens, as the taxpayers in this country, we need to hold people in power accountable. And this sort of bullshit cannot stand. Jeffrey Berman should be held accountable for what he did. The Southern District, Tom McKay, Nick Roos, um, you know, 
Ad- uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, Griswold, Andrea Griswold, all of them. They all need to be held accountable. Bill Barr, he needs to be held accountable. And despite the fact that we're over two and a half years now into the letter from Hakeem Jeffries, Ted Lieu, I mean, even new ones by Steve Cohen, Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney, um, Senator Dick Durbin, everyone has put in requests for investigations to be opened. And you know so far what's happened? Nothing. Zilch. Accountability. Well, Michael, it's a very... um, uh, It's a very um, long road to accountability. You know that I, I also feel strongly about the um, wrongdoing uh, that took place under Bill Barr at the Justice Department. Uh, We'll never know the full extent of it, most likely. Um, I wrote along afterward for your book explaining my own concerns, a little less colorfully than you do. Um, but the, the good news is that in, you know, and it's, it's hard for someone, I know it's hard for you, um, having been through what you've been through, um, you know, to see what Bill Barr did to the Justice Department, what happened under Bill Barr at the Justice Department. But the good news is, um, Alvin Bragg has made one part of that right. However, DOJ wrongly killed uh, the Trump case. And, you know, again, in um, less colorful language, but with equal, uh, you know, with, with, with equal conviction, I, I believe it was terribly wrong for DOJ not to pursue the campaign finance charges against Trump. Um, I know how tough it is. I did not succeed in including them in the impeachment. Um, Even though we investigated them, we had good claims. There just was tremendous internal pushback. It was not corrupt. It was a judgment, a judgment I disagreed with. I think under Bill Barr, the DOJ was corrupted. So the, the, but I prefer to focus on the progress and, you know, the, Indictment and arraignment of Trump represents progress. Like anyone, he's innocent until proven guilty. That's um, true. There's an over. There's an overwhelming. Uh, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence, and uh, this is far from the last case. He has got a tsunami of criminal and civil accountability coming his way. So, Norm, let me ask you this then, because. Just prior to the recording of this, you and I were talking about Judge Mershon and his expectations of a certain amount of decorum uh, by the prosecutors, by the defendants. He, you believe, witnesses as well in order to be careful what they say and to uphold the rule of law. Now, yes, just hours after that court appearance. And I'm talking about from the time that the orange-crusted Mandarin Mussolini took that fat ass up onto his plane and then landed and returned it to mar a He's sitting there and waiting before a group of mar a right? Also maggots is what we like to call them here. And he decides to give a speech. And of course, he decides to have dinner with the likes of Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gaetz, right? Because the poor baby's ego, his fragile ego, got beaten up sitting there, right, beneath the judge who he has contempt for and having to go through the process of the arraignment. But the second he stands up on that podium at Mar-a-Lardo in the ballroom, he starts to attack the investigation into him, Of course, denies all wrongdoing. He's the victim, right? And he then proceeds once again to criticize the judge, his daughter, the wife. I mean, he goes on saying, I have a Trump-hating judge 
with a Trump-hating wife and family whose daughter worked for Vice President Kamala Harris and now receives money from the Biden-Harris campaign. I mean, he goes on to do every single thing that the judge just told him not to do. Then Andrew Weissman went on, you know, and he was on television, you know, the former federal prosecutor. And he starts talking about the comments that Trump is making, not just about Mashan, his wife, daughter, but about Jack Smith. He, of course, makes fun of him uh, at this, whatever you want to call it, this gathering of goofballs. And then he turns around and he talks about um Fonnie Willis, he talks about Tish James, anybody that's against him. Whereas Weissman then calls his comments appalling and that heads of organized crime gangs would not behave in such a way, which I thought was interesting. And his exact quote, you do not have this behavior from a mob boss. There is a rule in organized crime that you do not do this with respect to prosecutors. You do not do this with respect to the judge. You certainly don't go after their families. It's bad business to do that. What the hell is Donald thinking, if anything at all? Um, Well, Michael, I I don't believe he's able to um, control himself any longer. And he was not gagged. no gag order was put into place. Uh, as I told Jim Acosta on CNN over the weekend, I didn't think prosecutors were going to seek one. I thought they were going to give him enough rope and see if he hangs himself. And he's well on the way to doing that. Uh, and uh, I don't think yesterday's remarks are going to be um, sufficient to bring that about. Uh, but um But that day of reckoning for his words is coming. Uh, And, um, you know, uh, I can't say that it was, uh, I can't say it was uh, unpacked here. Um, So um, there'll be more. There'll be further to go, but um, he's not going to be able, in my view, to keep carrying on like this. At some point, uh, the court is going to get fed up with him. Norm, what are they waiting for? For somebody to get hurt? I mean, you know, what's it going to take in order to place a gag order on? I'm not saying he wants to go and he wants to claim his innocence to the press. God bless him. I wish to God that I had done that. That when I was being attacked by Southern District of New York, of course, I only had 48 hours. So how much are you going to get done on a Friday to a Monday? But Don Jr. himself then goes ahead because Don's trying to crawl up. You know, he's trying to get daddy's love and attention. He posts a picture of the judge's um, daughter on their Truth Social or wherever the hell that he put it up. That's serious stuff. And again, a a lot of these magas are unhinged and somebody could easily get hurt. I'm just trying to figure out how much more does this lunatic in chief have to do before which somebody like Judge Mershon, who's a no nonsense judge, will not take Donald shit. That's for sure. He's going to turn around and say, you crossed the goddamn line, Donald. All right. And here's your last warning. I mean, personally, I'll tell you what I would love to see. I'd love to see Mershon call up one of the crackerjack lawyers that was sitting at that table, right? And say, I want Donald in my office on Friday. Put his ass back onto the plane, bring him back here to New York. All right. Sit him down, explain to him what he can and he can't do in third grade terms, right? Maybe draw it out in crayon so that he understands it with maybe some stick figures, what you can and you can't do. And the next time that you do this, I place a gag order on you and then I'm going to bring you back in to serve you with that gag order. And then you do it again. Then I'm holding you in contempt and you're going to be sleeping the night in jail. That's the only way to deal with Donald. Um, 
the judge is not going to do that because of the First Amendment, the jurisprudence around gag orders, the practice in courts of giving a defendant a chance and another chance, the coded language, uh, the high profile nature of the case. The Everybody has been put on notice. It was discussed in court, including the two most disturbing statements in my view, quote, death and destruction, close quote, which was the closest thing we had to the will be wild tweet that triggered January 6th, set up January 6th. Um, and uh, the image of Trump swinging a baseball bat at Bragg's head. Um, and now they're going to let it play out. You know, there's a saying, Michael, in the halls of justice, justice is in the halls. And what that means is one of the first things I learned as a young trial lawyer getting trained on how to do criminal trials here in D.C., D.C. Superior Court, one of the great metropolitan um, criminal dockets in the country. You get a little bit of everything. Um, um, one of the, that was one of the first things they taught me. And what it means is the law is not just what's written in the books. It comes to life. It comes off the page by the culture and the practice. And the practice is, you know, you're not going to gag a defendant, even one as loose-lipped as Trump uh, on the first day of the case at the arraignment. If he keeps it up and he crosses the line, he's going to get gagged. And if he doesn't respect the gag order, then you're looking at contempt and you know, um, possible uh, pretrial incarceration. So, um, so we'll just, but we're far from that right now. No, I, like uh, I said, I think that, I think Michonne would be making a mistake until, and listen, somebody gets hurt, then, you know, I don't want to be the guy to turn around to say, hey, I told you so, but this is what Donald does. This is exactly what we saw on January 6th. And I'm afraid that with his incendiary language, that that's something that can happen again. But Norm, let me just move on and ask you this question, because, look, a lot of people were very angry um, about Alvin Bragg a year ago with the Mark Pomerantz scenario, not bringing the case as it was provided when he first took the office as the um, district attorney of New York. So why do you think that Alvin Bragg decided that now was the time to prosecute Trump after earlier dropping the case? And what do you think finally changed his mind? Um, I think that um, the guy's only been there for a year little over a year we know that from vance we know that doj told vance uh not to proceed on this um direction uh while vance was in office so bragg started with a fresh slate we know from vance that uh he did not decide to bring or not bring the case he really did pass the torch to bragg um you know I think Bragg correctly blocked out the politics and went about building a case. You know, Michael, um, the vast amount of this case uh, is uh, comprised of other witnesses, documents, texts, emails, checks, check stubs, ledger entries. <laughs> um, there's a pile of corroboration. It takes time to assemble that, to check it, to build the theory of the case. Look, I've written extensively um, hundreds and hundreds of pages of legal analysis about the case over the past two years. And as I say, I spent a lot of time investigating it, uh, starting with talking with you and reviewing all the evidence. I spent almost, uh, almost uh, a year looking at the case before, um, before, the um, Ukraine events happened and we decided to proceed on impeachment based on Ukraine. Um, it, it, it takes time to put a case together. And I think Bragg went when he was ready. Good for him. 
and um, it, solid job on the indictment and the statement of facts. I thought he did a good job announcing it. He did not leak. Everybody was surprised by the filing of the indictment last Thursday. That's a positive thing. And uh, I am um, impressed so far. And we'll see where he goes with it. Okay. I to listen, I totally agree with you. Can you just touch for a quick second more on the whole Southern District of New York telling the District Attorney of New York, stand down on this, stand down on the co-conspirator, on any potential charges that could be brought. Can we then talk about how Jeffrey Berman did the same thing, how the determination, how they decided that they were going to scrub Donald Trump's name from, uh, you know, the 42 page um, document by the Southern District of New York, not to call him by his first name and only to call him individual number one and try to get rid of that as well. Can you tell me why, as the former ethics czar, right, that nobody so far has been successful in getting a single document out of government on this and the fact that nobody at the Southern District is being held accountable because it goes to my next question here. A lot of people, a lot, have been texting me and, like I said, former, pro former prosecutors wanting Bragg to justify bringing Trump into Manhattan on the $130,000, right, the hush money, as opposed to, for example, doing it via Zoom, right? But considering that it costs millions of dollars in resources, police, security, the whole nine yards. And you and I both know, and people who have an open mind know, that there's more to the case than just that. But truth be told, there's too many average Americans that don't. Do you think that bringing him in for this arraignment and doing everything that they did is worth it, basically telling the world, telling every single American the adage that no man is above the law? Um, I, do, I, I, I do, and uh, I think it's well worth it. And I, you know, I as I wrote with John Dean, John Dean and I, and Michael, you're, you're a good member of the Troika. Uh, John Dean and I have a lot of experience with the investigation of uh, presidential crimes and misdemeanors, high crimes and misdemeanors, low crimes and misdemeanors. John, of course, was a uh, witness, the critical witness. Um, maybe I should say uh, John Dean was the Michael Cohen of his day. Uh, the, against witness in what would have been against Nixon in what would have been the impeachment proceedings against in and if Nixon hadn't resigned and what would have been the criminal trial the indictment that was being prepared if Trump uh, if uh, Ford hadn't pardoned Nixon um, have Trump on the brain this morning um, and uh, and of course I did the uh, impeachment against Trump uh, and litigated the very first case brought against him as president. Uh, literally the second after he raised his hand, we filed our first emoluments matter. Um, and I was involved in opening hundreds of other legal matters against Trump in the years that followed most prominently the impeachment. And I'm still doing it. I'm still filing briefs in many of these cases. Um, um, so from that perspective, I think that the rule of law matters. My study as a former ambassador of other countries commonly proceed against chief executives. My work as an ethics czar, other um, states and the federal government bringing many cases against political figures, including state and local chief executives, mayors, governors. We just had a Con con corruption conviction um, in Los Angeles of one of the formerly most powerful members of the Board of Supervisors there. Um, if it, It's like the legislature um, um, uh, and, you know, L.A. would be 
a large country if it were a freestanding economy. So, you know, he was just convicted. This is vitally, what has happened here is vitally important for all the frustrations. And I know you sometimes do feel those frustrations and you express yourself very vividly about it. Uh, <laughs> for all, for all, but for all the frustrations, um, uh, you know, it's it, it is a bumpy path to accountability against the once most powerful man in the country and the world, and still one of the very best known individuals on the planet. You know, I litigated against Trump. I know how hard it is. I was on the receiving end of those uh, of the tweets and the abuse and the manipulation and the disinformation when we were doing impeachment. Um, I struggled with questions about, like Bragg did, uh, when Bragg, you know, offered Trump to appear before the grand jury. Um, how, how, how do you extend rights to somebody like that when you know they're going to abuse them? But uh, in the end of the day, uh, it's the right thing to do that. And it's the right thing to bring the cases. Bragg is doing the right thing. Right. I understand that. But now I want to bring it back to the SDNY, since we'll all acknowledge that no one is above the law. Same should hold true for Southern District of New York. Same should hold true for Jeffrey Berman, for Nick Roos, Tom McKay, Andrea Griswold, and all of those that participated in not just the, I mean, not just the first go around. I mean, who gives 48 hours when you have never in your life? And I talk about it all the time. I, there is no tax evasion. And I'll say it, and I hope that they try to bring it up on, on, uh, on cross, you know, when I'm there on the witness stand, I've said it. I wrote a whole book about it, Revenge, on what transpired here, on the disgusting behavior of those who have power over another. How come no one from the SDNY, how come after nine months after a judge ordered that the government is supposed to start processing at a minimum of 500 documents per month under FOIA, I not not only have I not gotten the 4,500 documents that I should have, I haven't gotten even a single one. They continue to say, well, methods and process, we can't get. And then the judge says, well, you have to turn it over. And then they come back with the same bullshit month after month after month. How come there's no accountability by the SDNY? There's no accountability by FOIA. And what makes me madder than hell is the fact that we're in a democratic Right now, government, Merrick Garland should be on top of this shit. But sleepy Merrick is just sitting there. No, doing absolute no, fucking no, 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 nothing. No, 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 no absolutely Michael, no. nothing. Bullshit. No. He's no, done absolutely know, nothing wrote... and nobody could say anything different. And Joe Biden needs to turn around and take control of his justice department. No, God forbid. God forbid Joe Biden would have anything to do with this. Replace well, him. I Replace him. Replace him with someone that wants to do work. <laughs> I have to. I have to dissent. First of all, um, Jack Smith is very actively pursuing the um, classified documents investigation and the January 6th attempted coup election overthrow investigation. So Merrick Garland has... Uh, appointed a fierce special counsel who's looking at, um, you know, looking at two fresh cases, rightly or wrongly. I think they were wrongly closed. Those other matters were closed by the Trump Justice Department. The place where we're going to see accountability, um, I feel your pain. I really do, a uh, personal basis. But the place where we're going to see accountability is in the states for the 2016 election interference, uh, Alvin Bragg, and for the 2020 election interference, Bonnie Willis. And Michael, something I don't think we've ever talked about on the show, and we should talk about it, not just Bonnie Willis. Your listeners should know, if you're paying close attention, other AGs uh, around the country are paying attention to what's happened in New York uh, and uh, 
funny uh, uh, and in Georgia. Now in New York and Georgia, you have local DAs and other places, according to press reports. Um, you have AGs. They are looking at that election overturn. So I wouldn't be surprised. We should we should start the analysis right here on mea culpa, Michael. I wouldn't be surprised at all if you saw additional state cases. That's where you're going to get more accountability. So I don't, I might disagree. Frankly, you want to know, and you're involved in this too. You want to know the my biggest disagreement, respectful disagreement with DOJ. It's that the... Uh, Bill Barr utterly distorted the facts and the law to cover up for Trump on the at least five obstruction of justice charges and probably 10 that any other American would have been charged with uh, that were laid out in the Mueller report. So where's the investigation, and Norm? It's not... That's my most biggest, most respectful disagreement. And, but, but I'm so sorry. Wait, wait. I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ambassador. My question to you then would be, <laughs> my question would be, who would be the one then to bring the investigation to the forefront? Would it not be the Attorney General of the United States of America? Would he not be the one? Um, the, here's what happened, Michael. <laughs> You're going to yell at me. You're not going to like this. Merrick Garland made a judgment that that case, rightly or wrongly, had been closed by his predecessor, that he inherited a DOJ that was in, a, in disarray, that was severely damaged, and that he was not going to look in the rearview mirror. He was going to move forward. And he was going to, if they arose, prosecute new matters. He's doing that with the special counsel. He's doing that with the January 6th crimes and not reopen the decisions of Bill Barr. I disagree with it. And hence Um, I rest my case, which is why he needs to be replaced. And we need to have somebody that's more interested in the protection of law and in order to reestablish the the, um, DOJ as a legitimate arm of government, not the illegitimate arm that became Donald Trump's, you know, um, personal law firm, and personal hit squad. So can I ask you this, though, since we brought up uh, Jack Smith in the mar lardo documents case? Because I've heard and I've read that it appears to be wrapping up. And yes, Merrick Garland appointed Jack Smith. Does that mean that now the guy like uh, with Ted Cruz is off to Cancun, you know, for a vacation because he appointed Jack Smith? Merrick Garland's not the one doing the work. That's Jack Smith. But Allegedly, this case is wrapping up. What signs do you see that that's happening? And more importantly, do you think that that's the next case to drop against Trump? Or do you think it'll be the DA Fonnie Willis's case? What do you think is next? Uh, I think the waterfall of troubles for Trump are... um, One... Fonnie Willis, yes. Fonnie Willis is I agree. Next in Georgia. I think What's the, your time frame? Um, I think the um I, I would expect something as soon as oh, April feels a little soon to me because she's going through this process that now processing the special grand jury report, dealing with that before the regular grand jury. Uh, I would guess May, May, you know, some, certainly sometime before summer holidays um and then after that um you know in parallel with that or after the classified documents case the federal classified documents case i think the federal january 6 case is trailing for various reasons there's various indicators that the classified documents case is moving faster including the getting trump's lawyer evan corcoran to forcing him to testify under the crime fraud exception to attorney crime pro- client privilege. And they, they, there's just a lot. They're bringing witnesses back a second time. There's signs that that grand jury is wrapping up. It's not totally out of the question that that could be faster than um, than Willis. Um, and then, you know, we should keep an eye on the civil cases. Uh, the it, 
Trump's not a defendant, but boy, that Fox Dominion case. Wow. 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 Um, uh, that's going to trial in April. That's going to be very impactful. And um, the E. Jean Carroll libel case, that's going to damage Trump civil, but going to damage Trump reputationally, financially, I think. That's going to trial in April. In October, you have the quasi-death penalty case. Effectively, it'll shut down the Trump organization being in Trump hands. If um, New York AG Tish James is successful in securing relief, um, that case is based on a lot of the stuff that you talked to Congress about uh, when you came clean, the financial misconduct. Uh, and as I say, there, I think there are other cases in the pipeline behind that. So that's what the year ahead looks like. And Judge Marshawn set this um, Bragg case down for trial in January. Judge Marshawn is a very no-nonsense judge. Trump can't do a lot of the delaying appeals. He's got some procedural tricks potentially up his sleeve. Um, so, you know, we'll see what we'll see what happens. Uh, and of course, it's all playing out against the backdrop of the uh, of the uh, political season. So going to be very, very interesting. You know, what's also interesting, if you take the uh, Mara Lardo documents case by Jack Smith, this is where. Donald should really, as you rightfully put it from the beginning, stay off television and maybe just retreat to the golf course while he's still permitted to do so without an ankle monitor. So he's sitting with an interview with Sean Hannity and the fool admits to willful retention of documents. Sean Hannity could not have thrown him a better softball by saying to him, Donald, you would never hold on to classified documents. I mean, you know, that deliberately possess these documents. Um, and he goes, no, 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 Sean, Sean. He goes, I'm the president. They're my documents. I can do whatever I want with them. They're mine. He goes, under the Presidential Records Act. And, th and then, of course, he starts to talk about, which, of course, he clearly doesn't know that that's not true. The president does not own the documents. It's owned by the American people. But then he has to throw in his favorite thing, which is Joe Biden had tens of thousands of documents and and he stored tens. That's also not true. I mean, in one sentence, you have just a multitude of lies, which is amazing. So I would like you, I, I believe that the Fannie Willis, the DA uh, case, will be next, but I think very shortly after that, I think you're going to see the Mar-a-Lago case um, come to fruition because I think it's also a very easy case to prove, very much like Bragg's case, because it's based solely on documents and the fact that he possessed it and using his own words, he knew he had them. And he was going to keep them because he was allowed to in his own mind. But can I move on for one quick second and ask you this? So Alan Weisselberg, right, former CFO at the Trump Org, he's almost done with his stint in Rikers. But right now, I'm hearing that there might be new charges brewing and that there's pressure on him to potentially testify and truthfully regarding Trump. Now, he just got a new lawyer, which is, um, you know, Paid for. I don't know if it's paid for by Trump or not, but can you read the tea leaves and tell us what you think is next for Weisselberg, if anything? Um, no, I can't read the tea leaves on Weisselberg. It's very mysterious to me. Will he be forced to testify? Did they bring him in to testify before the grand jury? Did they get relevant testimony in the prior grand jury to lock him in on these points so he's not a hostile witness? Um, you know, there's obviously a lot of Weisselberg evidence in the statement of facts. Did some of that come from him? Some comes from documents and other sources. Some comes from you. Don't comment on that, please. 
Um, but you can <laughs> tell just from reading it. Don't comment. I'll accept the laugh. Don't comment otherwise. Um, the um, the um, uh, the tea leaves are murky. You know, it's funny. Somebody asked me on TV. What's your prediction? I And I stopped them. I said, I don't make predictions. I analyze what's going on based on the evidence and the law that I have in front of me today, today. Um, and I'm not able to analyze exactly what's going on with Weisselberg. Boy, they really did. If they did not force some cooperation on this, at least to block him out, in advance, so you know what he'll say as a defense witness, and you can impeach him. I don't know what to think if the DA's office didn't do that. They're very experienced operators over there. They do this all the all the time. So uh, even though they didn't get full cooperation from him, I got to think that at least they know what, what he'll say if Trump calls him. Yeah. Can I go back to something that we were talking about, the insurrection? Because you played a major role in trying to hold Donald and others accountable for their participation. Do you think that any of Trump's henchmen in the House and the Senate will ever be held accountable for their participation in the insurrection? Because in all fairness, that seems to be... The biggest case against Trump, if we're going to put it like in a horse race, right? We're, we're going to pick the trifecta here, which is first, second, third, and then fourth, right? But I also believe that it's the hardest to prosecute. So these guys in the House and uh, in, in the Senate, they're still out there pretending that the big lie is the truth. They keep going on television and discounting exactly what we know really happened. What do we have to do to prosecute them? If anything, is, is there any way to hold them accountable? Because right now, that's the word of the day, accountability. Um, well, um, I think that the most I'm going to say something else that is going to aggravate you now. Oh, boy. That's part of why that's well, that's part of why people love to listen. Do you know how many people tell me they say, you know, it's like going to the bar and having a beer with you <laughs> and Michael. Like people love that because neither one of us holds back at all. Right. So. I think the most important ingredient, accountability for Trump, accountability for others, what's happening with these cases, the most important ingredient now is patience. The cases are happening. I went on TV, Michael, I was on, other than Shabbat, I think I was on TV like 14 days in a row, which is the most I've done on CNN. I'm exclusive to CNN. The most I've done since the second impeachment. Uh, 14 days in a row, telling people charges were coming. It's a good case. You got to have some patience. Um, and I think what we need to have now for the sake of accountability is patience. I think we need to, you know, as as I said when we started, we need to be judicious in what we say. We need to let prosecutors do their thing. We need to reserve judgment like we're at the beginning of this case. You know, there's much more to come. Um, uh, and I think we need to be patient. Account patient. Accountability is coming. Let it work. Re read the tea leaves when you can. I've done that with you today. When you can't read the tea leaves, like with Weisselberg, say so. Reserve judgment. Uh, I believe prosecutors, very effective, brag, Willis, Jack Smith, others who in the states who are looking at potential 2020 election interference crimes in their states, let them do their jobs. Uh, and uh, you are not a patient person, but for you, you know for what, everybody Norm, listening, you know what? even I, for I those am, who I aren't am. listening, I counsel you know what? patience. Okay, so I agree with you. Patience is important. However, let me draw this distinction, my dear friend. 
other people who are not members of Congress have already been charged, are already in prison right now. Is there two separate laws in this country? I, I believe that there are. And that's exactly why I ended up doing time. Explain to me why none of the members of the House or the Senate who were involved in the insurrection have been held to the same level of accountability that the Oath Keepers or any of these other insurrectionist bastards have been. It's as easy to prove what they were doing as it is the other people. I just don't understand why there's no accountability. I, and it's not like they don't have two years worth of facts. They do. They have testimony. They have videos. They have, they have emails and text messages. What more do you need than two people engaging in conversation about an insurrection and participating in it? And those scumbags still get to wear the congressional pin around their neck. It, it burns me alive. I can't stand it. Well, um, accountability is coming for them, too. If, for example, in Congress, uh, if they uh, try to take on, uh, if they try to take on uh, Bragg, they try to subpoena him in, enforce that subpoena to talk about this case, they're going to go to court and they're going to be slapped down. You know, their own words making so clear that they want to interfere with the case, uh, their own words uh, hang an anvil around their necks for that purpose. So patience, Michael, it's going to, the voters are not going to tolerate these. These people got elected by a much narrower than predicted margin to take over the House of representatives to deliver results. What have they delivered so far, my friend? Bupkis. Ungats. Bupkis. <laughs> Nothing, as we like Ungots. to say in Brooklyn. Uh, Nothing. That's yeah. Bupkis. Hey, that's my so, that's my Brooklyn <laughs> lingo. Exactly. Gornish. So Norm, look. Gornish. Yeah, Gornish Let me is translate right. Ungats. I'll translate it into Mamalushan. Gornish. Nothing. The, the, there you go. So look, Norm, as you know, we always have a lot of fun uh, on the show. The hour goes by quickly. I have this one last question for you. In the midst of all of these Trump legal actions, the chaos, and so on, how does Joe Biden compete for airspace? Because if you think about it, Biden has been quiet on Trump and just going about his business. By the way, He's still doing good things for the country, but no one knows. I mean, it's all watching Lardass get into his plane, fly it to New York, and then fly back. I mean, it's been Donald Trump 24-7 for good reason. But what about Joe Biden? I mean, two more years of Trump dominating the news cycle. I, I really do believe that it could affect the 2024 election. Now... I want to ask you your opinion. Do you think it will be good for Biden and Democratic candidates to get out there, do something, say something, try to take over some media so that people know what they're doing or no, just continue not, to say nothing? No. Biden should have nothing to do with any of these matters. He should not comment beyond saying, you know, we'll let the rule of law take its course. No comment. We're, you know, almost... Uh, uh, we're we're let's see april may june july august september october november we're more than 18 months away from the 2024 general election there's plenty of time for biden to fill the airwaves my analysis of the polling data and the uh, uh other political science evidence is that the more focus there is on Trump's wrongdoing, the worse he and the Republicans do in every election up and down the ballot. This has been a, um, you know, um, a, a revelation, I think, to the, all the proceedings. That's why I did impeachment. That's why I wrote my book, A Case for the American People. We started this with the emoluments case on day one, 
Uh, minute one, literally minute one of the Trump administration, hundreds of legal matters I've dealt with since the impeachment. We made the case, the American people, Donald Trump is a corrupt president. Everything else is, I predicted in the last chapter of the book, he's now he's going to interfere with the elections because that's what the impeachment was about. And sure enough, he did it in 2016. He did it in 2019, Ukraine. He did it big time in 2020. So, um, you know, um, Biden can lay low. The American people will pass judgment. Your participation has been a big part of that. Um, I think now it's time where we started, time for you to stand back from this case, let the justice system do its work. But, you know, I'll always be on here to talk about whatever you want to talk about, Michael. Well, I always appreciate you, Norm. There's no one that tells it like like it is. <laughs> <laughs> whether I like it or not. So I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on. Um, this is going to be a bumpy ride. It's going to be a bumpy ride for America. It's going to be a bumpy ride for the for justice, um, for the Justice Department. It's going to be a bumpy ride for everybody. So as I tell everybody, you know, buckle up because it's going to get ugly, certainly ugly before, you know, it gets nice out. That's... There's no doubt in my mind on that. And I want to thank you as always. Um, stay safe, my friend. And yes, I need to have you back very, very soon. Thanks, brother. Talk soon. You got it.